Well, good morning again. Good to see you here. We notice that we've got a few away today, um, holidays, etc., and so on. Um, it was interesting listening to Garth's report this morning on his uh, his knee, <coughs> and um, I have had some recently. I've had some rather miraculous messages come to me, and um, at night time, generally. Uh, when I'm dead to the world, sound asleep, and uh, we had some visitors staying with us over this last week, and um, they came from Queensland. And one of the things that they do, the um, they walk in, they come in the door, <coughs> and uh, the wife seems to do this, and she forgets to close the front door. Okay. And um, I live in a two-story house, so. Um, when, you, when you live upstairs, and so the front door was open, people, anyone could come in uh, down below. I was uh, sound asleep. It was 12.30 in the, uh, early in the morning, and suddenly, and this has happened to me before, uh, not the same thing, but other very miraculous things I've been told. Uh, suddenly at 12.30, a voice said to me, the front door was open. And I woke up. Of course, there's no one there. The voice was as clear, as clear, as clear. And I went downstairs, and sure enough, the front door was wide open. And I just closed it, checked through the house, and everything was good. So it's amazing how the Lord looks after you, isn't it? It's amazing stuff. And when I think back over all the, the things that I've done in my life, that the Lord has saved me. It's absolutely amazing. So my my sermon this morning I've entitled <coughs> the uh, the true identity of Jesus. <coughs> now, only the Bible authenticates itself. And it does this through a predictive prophecy, and it works like this. Only God knows the end from the beginning. And to help us learn to believe in him, he told his ancient people things that hadn't happened yet. Then when they did happen, as God said they would, God then had them documented and preserved for future generations. And today we call this documentation the Bible. <clears throat> and many, many things uh, of the things that have been prophesied have already been fulfilled. But there's still more to come. When asked what work God requires of us, Jesus replied, The work of God is this, believe in the one he has sent. And we can find that scripture in John chapter 6 because he's told us so many things in advance and has always been right, he expects us to believe in him. And God's view is that he has proven himself so far beyond any reasonable doubt that people who say they don't believe in him are really being disobedient by refusing to believe. <clears throat> and the Old Testament is so chock full of proof of God's existence, that there is simply no justification for unbelief. But if you want to prove the existence of God, you could read about uh, Alexander the Great uh, and compare it with a competent uh, history book, and then maybe a study Bible, and then you could verify the existence of God simply by comparing fulfilled prophecy with world history. Now Psalm 14 verse 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And only a fool can say that. Only a fool. But even a fool can't say it logically with his mind because there's too much evidence to the contrary. Of all the things we should believe about God, 
the most important one is that he sent his son to die for our sins. So that we could spend eternity with him. And many times we find this repeated throughout the Bible, don't we? Many times. So let's review a few of the better known prophecies relating to Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. And see if we can prove he's he is the one that God sent. And while we're at it, let's see if there is any possibility that he could have fulfilled these prophets, prophecies accidentally. Now, could this all have happened by coincidence? Or can we know that Jesus is the promised redeemer? So let's look at the first prophecy to start with. And that was... And is that Jesus was born of a virgin. <clears throat> now the Lord had Isaiah tell us that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Isaiah from the Old Testament. This would make him unique among men, among all men, and clearly identify him as the God, as the one that God was sending. Isaiah wrote the following passage about 750 BC. And he said in Isaiah 7, chapter 7, verse 14, he said, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call his name Jesus. Now the fulfilment of this prophecy was when the angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never, ever end. How will this be? How will this be, asked Mary, asked the angel, since I know not a man. And the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now the next prophecy is that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And Micah wrote, wrote about that in 750 BC. And the Lord had him identify the place where the Messiah would be born. And Micah said in Micah 5 verse 2, But you, Ephraim, Ephraim, uh, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. So when was this uh, fulfilment of this prophecy? And Luke 2 verse 4 to 7 tells us, and it says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lion of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and she was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. <clears throat> so now let's look at the next prophecy. And it is that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And Zechariah wrote about this in 519 to 518, around that time, at BC. And he said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous 
and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And we can read about that in Zechariah 9, verse 9. And then the fulfilment of that prophecy can be found in Luke 19, <clears throat> where it reads, As Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he said to two of his disciples, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, <coughs> which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. So the disciples who were sent ahead went and found it just as Jesus had told them. And as they were untying the colt, each other was asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt, on the colt, and they sat Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road ahead of them. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice of all the, because of all the miracles they had seen. And they were calling out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. <clears throat> now the next prophecy we need to look at is when Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and the money was later used to buy a potter's field. Again, this prophecy of Zacharias was written about 480 BC. I told him, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And you can find that in Zechariah 11. 12 to 13. And the fulfilment of that prophecy is found in Matthew 26, which reads, When one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked them, What are you willing to give me if I hand Jesus over to you? So the chief priests counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Jesus looked for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. And when Jesus, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said. I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they said. That's your responsibility. So Jesus threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the Lord who put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field and they use it as a burial place for foreigners. Now the next prophecy is that Jesus, although innocent, made no defence. And this prophecy comes from the book of Isaiah again, written about 750 BC, and it comes from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 7. And it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
<clears throat> and the fulfillment of that prophecy is found in Matthew 27. And it reads like this. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus answered. And when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimonies they are bringing against you? And to the great amazement of the governor, Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. Now the next prophecy also comes from Isaiah, and the prophecy was, was that, that, that Jesus would be punished for our sins. And this is another promise that the Lord had Isaiah write down in about 750 BC, and one of the most crucial for us to prove. And the prophecy was this, that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds are we healed. And we see the fulfillment of this prophecy in John chapter 1, verse 29, where it describes it as a primary goal of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament and from the beginning of his ministry it says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus was identified as the one who takes away the sins of the people. After Jesus' death, the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians, verse 5, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he would write, God made him who had no sin to be the sin for all of us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And again in Colossians verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, it says, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiveness, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, we read, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now, We've got the clincher. In Daniel 9, we find the most specific prophecy of all. And it was written just as the Babylonian captivity was ending about 500 BC, 530 BC. In it, the angel Gabriel explained to Daniel <coughs> that the Messiah would come to Israel and be executed in a narrow window of time between 480, between the 483rd year after permission to rebuild Jer Jerusalem was granted and the subsequent destruction of the city and the temple. And from history, history we know that this time frame was 38 years in the Jewish duration. <coughs> The prophecy said, Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issue of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be re rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in troublesome times. 
After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one uh, will um, will be cut off, and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and that's found in Daniel chapter nine. Now here, here is the fulfilment of that prophecy. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen Jesus do. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And Luke chapter 19, verses 37 to 42 tells us, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden. From your eyes. It was the first Palm Sunday, the only day in his entire ministry when the Lord allowed the people of Israel to call him Israel's king. It was exactly 483 years to the day after the Persian king Antaxerxes Longinimus signed a decree authorizing Nehemiah to go and begin rebuilding Jerusalem. It was also the day ordained in history for the Messiah to arrive in Jerusalem. And if only the priests, if only the priests and the people who had read the scriptures of Daniel had understood them and had taken notice, then things might have turned out differently. But they missed all the signs that Jesus was their Messiah. Luke chapter 19 tells us, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. And 38 years later, the Romans destroyed the city and tore the temple apart stone by stone until not one stone was left standing on the other. Just another case of predictive prophecy fulfilled. So what does all this mean? If you're looking for somebody, looking for someone else who you think might be the Messiah, you would have to find someone who fulfilled not only the seven prophecies that we have just talked about, but all the others also talked about in the Old Testament. And then to top it all off, that same person would need to give his life for us all within the 38 year window of time that God revealed to Daniel. So it is without doubt that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was the true Messiah of Israel and our only Redeemer and Saviour. He loved us so much that he came to this world prepared to die on the cross in agony to pay the price for our sins. And if we all accept him as our saviour, then one day, very soon, I believe, we will all get to spend our eternity in heaven together. Amen. Amen. Let's just close in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that we are able to be here to worship you and to hear your word. I ask you, Lord, that it might... Touch the hearts of everyone here. 
that we might be able to go on our way and remembering what the Lord has done for each one of us. And so, Lord, I commit ourselves to you. I commit our lives to you, Father, and be, ask you to be with us in the coming week. We just pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to be here this morning to worship our Lord, all he has done for us. And we have a wonderful God, and he loves us, each one. Amen. We don't deserve it, but he loves us. This morning I'm running a little short thought, and I've called it eternal life to be with him. What is eternal life? What is eternal life? Our Lord has defined it. It is a life eternal that it might know... Sorry, I'll start again. This is life eternal that you might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. John chapter 17, verse 3. That's eternal life. To know God and to know his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can say eternal life is many things, but God says to know the only true God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as John puts in his first epistle, where he writes in order that his readers may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, 1 John 1 3. In Psalm 73, it says, I want to keep near this God. I want to keep in touch with him. Do we want to keep in touch with God? I want to spend all my time with him. Do we want to spend all our time with God? I want to live always in his presence. Is that our desire? I like to think of his power and his promises and to remember his steadfast. God is steadfast in all he does. And is, and, it, <coughs> pardon me, and is this not comforting and consoling and to lift us up in our thoughts towards God? We do not know what awaits us. We live in this world that is full of change and we ourselves are inconsistent. Is there anything more wonderful than to know that at any moment we can enter the presence of the one who is everlasting and the same. Is that a joy to you? It's a joy to me. That any time, any moment, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like a shifting shadow. James chapter 1 verse 17 says that. Our Lord is mighty, glorious, his love, his mercy, his compassion, and the same in all that he has promised. Are we not drawn to our Lord and Saviour? Let us think more about God. You know what? The devil puts all sorts of things in our mind. So we don't think about God and our Saviour. Let us meditate upon him and his word. When we try to read God's word and spend time reading it, how do you find it? Do you find things being propping up? Telephone rings? Things come in to take our mind away from the word of God. We have an enemy who doesn't like us looking into the Word of God, doesn't like us talking to Him, but our God still loves us through His Son, the Lord Jesus. Let us 
turn our minds and our hearts towards him, let us realise that in Christ he offers us fellowship. And who doesn't like fellowship? He also offers us compassion and also that's always constant and steadfast. God never changes. He's the same this day, today and forever. God loves us. He gave his son to demonstrate the greatest love that's ever been. And this morning we've come to take these simple emptiness. The bread and the cup which speaks to us of a body that was perfect in every way. Yet God took my sin, your sin and placed on his son the Lord Jesus Christ who was not a sinner. He was perfect yet he became sin for you and me. So as we take these elements this morning may our hearts be drawn to him May our love for him grow stronger. That's why the Lord asks us to remember him in this way. So we don't forget what he done for us. We don't forget he gave his all. Have we given our all to the Lord Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great gift in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning. We gather here as your people who love you. We gather here this morning to take these emblems simply. Yet, Father, it reminds us of your love. It reminds us of your perfect plan. And, Father, but also reminds us we do it until we see you face to face. May our hearts this morning be touched as we quietly remember you. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.